Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So this is part four of the Zoom recorded lecture for the topic frustration. So in the previous parts, we have we have discussed about um, the principles, okay, the rule, and then we discuss about instances of frustration, and then we discuss also about the instances of no frustration. So for this part, we are going to look at the test for frustration. So basically, the, the test is known as radical change from obligation test. And we have a common law case as well as local case uh, to illustrate to us the application of this test. So what's the test is all about? So basically, um, uh, what the court will do is that the court will not hold the parties, okay, the contracting parties, to further performance of the contract if in the lights of the change circumstances, like the frustrating event, okay, after the frustrating event, so it's the change circumstances, there will be a radical change in the obligations under the contract because of the frustrating event. So it changed everything basically, the performance of the contract. So uh, the case uh, was adopted okay, by the majority of the House of Lords in, uh, in the case of Davis Contractors and Farham UDC 1956. So we'll see what, what is the facts of the case here. A building which was supposed to take eight months to complete, but it took longer. It took 22 months because of unexpected labor shortage, shortages. So the contractors claimed that their contract was partially frustrated, but the court disagreed with the contention. Because why? The delay, uh, when the court applied the, applied the test, okay, radical change from obligation test, okay, the delay, because the, the gross of frustration as, um, as claimed by, um, by the contractors was the delay. So the delay was not any new state of things okay, which the parties could not reasonably uh, be thought to have foreseen. So it's something which is possible. And this is part of the judgment which is relevant for our discussion here. The court also stated that frustration, okay, this is very, very important part, okay, frustration is not to be lightly invoked as the dissolvent of a contract. It shouldn't be used okay, in all uh, easily okay, without any uh, precaution. So it cannot be adopted in any cases whenever there is any problem with the contract. And after all, it is not hardship or inconvenience or material loss itself which cause the principle of frustration into play. It's not because of that. But there must be as well such a change in the significance of the, ob of the obligation that the thing undertaken, okay, whatever obligations under the contract uh, undertaken, okay, would, if performed, be a different thing from that contract for. Let's say if you look at the um, the typical or the extreme example, a uh, grounds of frustration, a uh, war, for example. So because of war, so whatever obligations by the parties, it change. Okay, the war, okay, the 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 change circumstances, okay, it change all the obligations of the parties. Okay, and then do we apply the test in Malaysia? Yes, the answer the answer is yes. Okay, and then it was actually applied by federal court in this particular particular case. Okay, let's have a look at the case here. Ramli bin Zakaria and Government of Malaysia uh, reported in 1982. So this is a appeal case, obviously. So who was the appellants here? Ramli bin Zakaria and others actually. He's representing a group of teachers here. So the appellants were a group of 86 vocational school teachers who were successful in the application for teacher training. So they have undergone the training and then they were successful. They were, um, uh, they were accepted as the teachers. And then when they sign the offer, okay, one of the conditions of the offer that the teachers will on completion of the course be accepted as teachers on the UTS scale. So that's the salary scheme that they will be uh, they, they they were they were offered to. Okay? But because the training took some time, so by the time they completed their course of training, the UTS scale in which they signed, in which it was stated in the contract, had been abolished, okay? no longer in existence. And um, there's a new scheme, okay, which is known as Abdul Aziz scheme, and it was being forced for that particular time. So because of that, the appellant, the appellants here, the, the teachers, okay, were offered salaries under this new scheme, under Abdul Aziz scheme. But they're not happy with the scheme. They wanted the old scheme. That's why they brought the case to the court. So this is the argument. Okay? They should have been paid salaries and allowances under the UTS scheme because when they signed the contract, um, that's the scheme okay, in which they were offered to. But respondent's argument, government Malaysia argument is that as the recruitment of teachers into the UTS had been discontinued, no longer, okay, the scheme is no longer available. So the offer to employ them under the UTS had become frustrated. So now government of Malaysia is pleading, was pleading uh, frustration, okay, all right? 
But the learned trial judge dismiss appellant's claim and then give judgment to uh, government of Malaysia. So now the, the, the appellants can appeal to the federal court. And this is the observation by the federal court here. Uh, the court actually reiterate the principle of the test, basically application of the test, radical change from obligation test. So where after a contract has been entered into, there is a change of circumstances, but the change circumstances, they do not render a fundamental or radical change in the obligation originally undertaken to make the contract something radically uh, different from that originally undertaken. So basically, What's the purpose of the scheme okay, for the payment of salaries and allowances? This whatever name it whatever name it is uh, assigned to. Okay, so basically the whole scheme, employment scheme whatsoever here. Okay, training and employment. The contract does not become possible and it is not discharged by frustration. The contract still remains as valid. And in this case, the uh, federal court said that it is wrong to say that to say that the contract was not capable of being performed. And actually, it was not therefore frustrated. It still can be performed. Okay, and then payment of salary can still be done. On the acceptance of Abdul Aziz's recommendations, okay, the government put into force an improved salary. So basically, the new scheme actually it is an improved salary scale, and then it is applicable to all um to, to basically to all the teachers, okay, government servants who are being paid under um, the, the salary scheme here. So because of that, UTS uh, scheme was uh, abolished and ceased to apply to the appellant. So it cannot be applicable. It's no longer in existence. And then after all, based on the new scheme actually, okay, the finding of the court is that the appellants were given a higher commencing salary and a more favorable scale than that of UTS. So eventually, uh, the contract remains valid and um, uh, judgment again was given to uh, government of Malaysia. Okay, so they, they can they can they uh, they could not success they could not succeed okay, in their claim. Okay, another subtopic that we want to discuss today is that or uh, self induced frustration. What if frustration is uh, being self induced okay, by one of the contracting party, especially those who claim for frustration? So it happened when a person contracting party deliberately, purposely. Intentionally, he renders performance impossible. He's the one who uh, who caused uh, the frustrating event. Okay? So where where the promisor himself is responsible for the frustrating event, so such a self-induced frustration does not discharge a party from his contractual obligations. So, but then um, instead of that, okay, he will be liable for breach of contract. He's the one who caused the the thing to happen. Okay? If he does not perform his obligation under the contract, so he cannot really escape from uh, performing so his obligation by claiming frustration. After all, it's self-induced. Okay? Remember the principle of frustration, it cannot be the fault of either party. So for self-induced frustration, one of the parties actually is responsible for the uh, frustrating event. We have the case here, this is common law case, Maritime National Fish and Ocean Trawlers, 1935. Uh, so the contract is between maritime and ocean. So maritime chartered from ocean a vessel, okay, which could, could only operate with an auto troll. So I put the picture auto troll there, okay, certain uh, uh, a large commercial fishing troll, okay, which use a kite like wooden box at the corner of the mouth in order to catch fish like that, okay, here. Yeah. And then both maritime and ocean knows, okay, realize that it was an offense actually to use such a troll without government license. They must get license because one, once they use this uh, auto troll, okay, they will catch all size of fish. So it will affect the population of the fish actually. So maritime was granted three, three only, whereas they have more than, uh, I mean, more than, more than three vessel, okay, they have more vessel, but the license only given three, okay. And then maritime choose to use the license in respect of other, uh, three other vessels, okay. Not the, the one that they uh, chartered to um, uh, Ocean, okay, alright. With the result that Ocean's vessel okay, could not be used because no license, it's not, not enough license here. So they brought, I mean, uh, they, dis, they uh, dispute, disputed whatsoever and then they brought the case to the court, alright. And then the court said, well, the charter party had not been frustrated, okay, why? Because Mother Time was the one, okay, Mother Time was freely, uh, was free, I mean, he, he they were the one who choose to license with whichever vessel that they have. So they cannot give license to ocean vessels. So they purposely, I mean, they deliberately did that. Okay, purposely, they know. Okay, so inability to use um, the vessel okay, without the license was a direct result of their own deliberate act. 
So because of that, maritime was liable to pay their charter fee, cannot actually escape from uh, being liable, okay, liability of payment. Okay, for local case, we have this case. Yi Seng Plantations, Number Hat and Kerajaan Terengganu. Um, this is a appeal case as well. So the appellant was the sub lessee of certain lands in Kerti, Terengganu. And in the years of 1984 and 1986, okay, government of the state of Terengganu acquired some of the land in the other lessee, remember, okay? So they lease the, the land, to, I mean, they lease out the land from the, uh, they got the lease to occupy the land and part of the land was acquired by the government. So they wanted to use the land, so they negotiated the things. Okay, they appellant to court an action challenging the acquisition because they are the lessee. They have the right as a lessee over the land, sub lessee, sorry. So the state legal advisor represented the, the government, I mean, to negotiate the things because they challenged the acquisition. So following negotiations between appellant's uh, lawyer, solicitor, and also state legal advisor representing government, the action, okay, action for acquisition was compromised and the agreement was recorded in the form of consent order. So the, the agreement is called consent order. So basically, the, um, government, uh, the state government agreed okay, to alienate the land later to uh, the, lessee, the lessee. Okay, and later there's problem, okay, difficulty arose when the state authority that is now uh, the ESCO okay, or State Executive Council rejected the appellant's application for the alienation whereas actually they, it, it was agreed when they negotiated the things with the uh, state legal advisor. Okay? So basically they don't want to honor whatever uh, terms in the consent order. So now respondent or, or the government here, com state government, commits an action seeking for a declaration that they were not bound by the terms of the consent order. And what's the uh, their argument here? They said that the decision of the ESCO was a supervening event, a okay, frustrating event, over which the respondent had no control. They cannot say anything. Okay, meaning they had, it's beyond their control, whatever decision by the uh, ESCO here. So because of that, the consent order was frustrated. Okay, they cannot really comply with the consent order because of the uh, decision of the ESCO. Okay, and then at the high court level, high court agreed with the state uh, Kerajaan Terengganu argument here and uh, granted the relief sought by them, but appellant was not happy. So appellant appealed against the decision. So the issue, uh, the, the relevant issues for our discussion here, okay, whether the consent order had become frustrated. Can we apply the doctrine of frustration here? And this is the observation by the court here. It is well, the court said, it is well settled law that the doctrine of frustration has no room, okay, cannot be applied whenever there is a fault on the part of the party pleading it. Those who plead for frustration cannot be guilty for the frustrating event, for the supervening event. So in the present case, the refusal of the ESCO to alienate the land in question okay, actually was a deliberate act, okay, intentional act of non-compliance. They don't want to comply with the consent order. Okay? So basically, it was not a supervening event at all. So in these circumstances, it was not open to the respondent to rely on the doctrine. So, so long they represent the state government, doesn't matter whether it's a state legal advisor or ESCO, they are all representing state government. So basically, to some extent, they have to um, comply with the terms in the consent order. They cannot simply uh, dishonor it okay? and pleading um, frustration like this case. This is the cases in the textbook, so uh, you can have a look so that you will understand the application of the rule better. We have the case of Dapat Yap Peng and Public Bank, as well as Lai Kok Kit, Elias Sulaiman, Sulaiman Ben Abdullah and MBM Finance uh, reported in 2000. So the last part of our discussion is consequences of frustration. What happened to the contract once the court um, allowed okay, the doctrine of frustration to be applicable? So basically the contract become becomes void okay, from that very uh, point of time. It, it's not void from the very beginning. So uh, in section 572, it is stated okay, the contract is terminated as to the future only because why it is not void from the very beginning. And what's the remedy? We, uh, the remedy is remedy of restitution. So we are, we, we are, I mean the court will order for restoration of the parties to their earlier position wherever possible. So in the case of public finance, uh, the court applies section 57 subdivision 2 and then uh, the court ordered okay, the appellants to return the, uh, the, the payment, okay, the money which has been paid, 57,000. Uh, and uh, as far as the remedy was con is concerned, okay, we have a civil law act. Okay, it talks about remedy of restitution. Uh, it's quite in, in, um, uh, in greater detail. Okay, it's quite a lengthy discussion. You can read. Okay, 
um, so that you will understand better. So for example, section 15, section 2, okay, it talk about the right to recover money paid, okay, money paid before, money paid after. Basically, it's recoverable. We, we get, uh, the court can order for the money to be uh, returned. Okay? You can read uh, later, okay, this is only for your knowledge purpose, all right? And then whatever money payable before the time of frustration, frustration, so it ceases to be payable, no longer payable because it stops there. Okay, the contract is what from that sense, so it's no longer payable. Okay, uh, this is also uh, another case to talk about the uh, remedy, okay, or the effects. National Land Finance Com uh, Cooperative Society Limited and Shari Dal, Selamat 1983. So it is pertaining to celebrity of certain immovable property and one of the condition of the agreement is that it is um, the parties, the sale should be subject to approval of Foreign Investment Committee, FIC. So FIC actually, actually refused approval but FIC gives certain suggestion of how to uh, make it uh, possible okay, with the application. In that here, um, property to be transferred to a joint venture company of which at least 30% of the is equity, okay, the shares, is held by Bumiputra. So because of that, okay, respondent argued that a res uh, agreement be became void okay, when the FIC refused to approve the sale. But the appellant um, argued that the okay, agreement did not become void because there was a, it was a conditional approval by FIC. So uh, we, whose argument actually um, was accepted by the court here. So trial just said, said that the agreement became become void okay, uh, because uh, the parties cannot really proceed with, even with the suggestion of the FIC. And because of that, um, the, the court ordered uh, the return of the, the refund of the deposit under section 15, section 2, Civil Law Act is now, okay? And federal court affirmed the charges decision. So this case illustrates to us the, 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 the return of the deposit once the contract becomes void under frustration. And for Yong, Yong Unkai, this is only for your knowledge purpose, um, this is a case from Sarawak. For Sarawak, they, they apply uh, this Law Reform Frustrated Contracts Act 1943. This is actually uh, a statute from England because the kind of date um, for Sarawak is 1st April 1972 but for Peninsula is 1956. So that's why they applied this, um, this act. Okay, but for uh, other part of Malaysia, they, we didn't apply, we don't apply this act. So again, uh, uh, what's the remedy? The court ordered the defendant to return to the plaintiff the money is advanced to him. So it's uh, an order to return, restoration okay, of the parties to their earlier position. Okay, we are done with the topic frustration. So altogether, there are, um, okay, I stop sharing first. There are four parts uh, of the recorded lecture. So hopefully you, you are able to watch it all and then try to understand. Okay. Until then, uh, thanks for listening. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.